Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. If you're not new here, thank you so much for coming back. You already know I love and I appreciate you so, so freaking much. Um, we, we're, there, there's really not much to say. We're just going to get right into it today. Um, I have a Canadian case for you today, one that I did not know about that I'm just floored about because I know the name very, very well. Um, and yeah, I, I haven't stopped thinking about it, so we got to share it with you. But before I do, I have a quick message for you. Thank you so much to our sponsor today, Fume, not only for sponsoring just today's video and all of your support, but your continued support. I absolutely love this brand so much, not for how much it's helped me. I love the feedback that I get from you guys who have now become customers. And one of the greatest things that I love hearing from you, not obviously that it's helped you so much, but how much you also love the company and you feel like appreciated. They're just really, really, really great to work with. If you've never heard of Fume, though before I go further let me get you caught up. Fume is an innovative award-winning device that helps with what can be a really stressful transition of breaking up with bad habits into a much enjoyable and attainable process. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air and instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all natural delicious flavors. Like I said, if you have seen my videos about Fume before, you know how much I love them, how appreciative I I am that they helped me so much. They also graciously gifted me their newest device, the Solano, which was released in November. And I can't say it enough. Like it is so cute. Not it's it's not cute. The other one I felt like was cute. This is my like sleek, sexy, hot villain that you want to cheer for and love version of you. Now, funny story, and this is, okay, literally I cannot make this up because it's going to be like, wow, that was weird how you segued into that, Sherilyn, but this is the honest to God truth, okay? Last video I did with Fume, I was freaking out because I didn't have my Fume. I was like, oh my gosh, brand new, where is it? I want to fidget with it, couldn't find it, but my sister had like just been over and she had picked up a bad habit that I was like, okay, why don't, why don't you try the fume out and that was kind of like the extent of the conversation I just assumed that she would try it and then like put it back well we were rearranging things I had put it in a box with my other fume my two babies I'd put them in like a box for safekeeping and in my mind I was like okay like this will be good and I'll go back to the box well I completely forgot about it it's like when you hide something and you, you just you think that it's for the best and then you never see it again that's what almost happened so when I asked her if she had it and she said no I was I was horrified anyways long story short I found it fume also just again above and beyond took care of my sister so now she's she's got one of her own I don't have to accuse her of anything and then I found out that fume now came out with a, an additional component and it's called the base it launched in January it's a weighted stand that your fume can rest on when it's not in use. It has a magnet inside to keep your fume attached and then the fume can be spun around on it so you can still fidget with it. And I was like, wow, wouldn't that have been nice to have this adorable base for my fume instead of putting it in a box and thinking I was gonna remember it. Anyways, cannot make that up. I know, I know when I saw this, I was like, wow, people are gonna think I'm lying, but I'm not. Again, do not take my word for it. Fume has served over 150,000 customers. They have thousands of success stories, obviously, me being one of them. There is no reason you can't be either. So join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup with destructive habits and pick up your journey pack today. You can also upgrade your journey pack to the Solano to enjoy the premium walnut barrel and onyx black coated mouthpiece for a much smoother finish. Head to tryfume.com slash Sherilyn Dale or scan the QR code and use code Sherilyn Dale to get 10% off when you get the journey pack. That's tryfum.com slash Sherilyn Dale to save an additional 10% off your order today. Thank you, Fium. I love you. All right. Like I said, I came across this Canadian case and it has consumed me. It is the Nancy Eaton case and Nancy Eaton was the heiress and a member of the very prominent Eaton family. Eaton's department stores was like the department stores in Canada. My dad actually still talks about the Christmas trees at Eaton's. <laughs> Whenever he sees like a really nice bougie Christmas tree, he's like, that looks like an Eaton's Christmas tree. And yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just like a 
Canadian staple. So in terms of this case, even though it is solved, I really did a lot of reflection throughout it and then after. And it made me want to share this case even more because I feel like I'm frustrated that it sounds like we've done really a lot of progress. I think we all want to think that we've done a lot of progress since, I mean, at the very least, the 80s when this is going to take place. And I've just learned that in terms of mental health specifically and treatment, I'm like, I don't really see any difference. I mean, obviously, there's like a little, little bit of difference. But like from the 80s, like we we have got to hold people accountable and make some real changes. So I will share my my opinion on all of it, like once we've gone through everything um, at the end, but I just want you to kind of have that in mind as we go through this, just like thinking of the type of mental health care that we're providing today compared to what it was 40 years ago and how you feel about it. Especially because I feel like when we consume true crime, watch and listen to true crime, there definitely is a lot more discussions today, which I really appreciate. I do think that there needs to be open discussions of how to watch and consume true crime ethically, hold creators accountable that you don't think are being ethical and what, you know, maybe that they could do different. And I guess the main thing is if there there needs to be like a lesson, there needs to be a reason why we can't just have uh, Gavin's <laughs> Gavin's explanation for it always comes to me where he's like I'm not out here to bu- to provide like murder you know corn P O R N it's he he doesn't want people just to come in like come and get all the nitty gritty and nasty details and I'm the same and I feel like with every case if we're gonna share it there needs to be a lesson learned and in the case of Nancy Eaton she was like slaughtered like there is literally no way to sugarcoat that and I don't want to because you need to hammer home the severity and the seriousness of these situations and that her murder a thousand percent percent preventable and here we are 40 years later and in my opinion there's just like not enough progress to prevent these things from happening and then when we share these cases it's literally like our victims are dying in vain where that is not the point we need to share this to make a change make people more aware and prevent it from happening again as always i want to i want to start with nancy and who nancy was in life, not in death. Nancy Eaton was born May 28th, 1961. She was the great, great granddaughter of Timothy Eaton, who was the founder of the Eaton's department store. And she is the only daughter of Edward Eaton and her mother also named Nancy, Nancy Lee Eaton. You can tell just by her name, I guess like the the prominence and the, the status of the family. Nancy's full name is Nancy Alice Edward Eaton. So she was like carrying on family names like royals, even though she was Nancy. They, they popped that Edward in there. Shortly after Nancy's birth, her parents discovered that she had quite a severe hearing impairment. She only had 2% uh, hearing in one ear and then only 1% in the other. Despite this though, her parents sent her to a school just like I mean quote unquote traditional school and opted out of sending her to one that worked with children with hearing impairment so she wore hearing aids and then she learned how to lip read to get by it is said that she did struggle a little bit academically perhaps because of that not picking up everything at the time and I think also there was probably not as many resources for people back then when they were opting to you know like just go the lip reading route I actually love following I think her name is Abigail why is her name blanking to me oh my gosh she was on The Bachelor and it's very similar situation she lip reads and I think she's a really cool influence for anybody who also is limited in their hearing or can't hear at all and they're they're deaf and and she you would never know with her and she just does not let that affect her at all but I don't think that it was obviously talked about as much than in the 80s so Nancy actually ended up going to 18 different schools and you know because kids can just be ruthless sometimes she was also the victim of a lot of bullying Uh, not only just for her disability, but also because of her weight. 
And at only 11 years old, she ended up experiencing a quite a traumatic, just emotional breakdown from everything that lasted several years. Ultimately, it was Nancy's mother who was just constantly there to root her on, support her. She helped her overcome every obstacle, all of the negativity that she was receiving. And Nancy, she turned out to be a really beautiful, kind, caring young woman who put other people before herself. She really wanted to be there and let everybody know that they had her support and, you know, kind of make sure that nobody felt the way that she did when she was younger. When Nancy was only five years old, her parents ended up getting divorced. It at the time did not sound like um, a very pleasant experience to go through. They were in and out of court. And Nancy's father, although he was an Eton and like the heir to this fortune, he didn't really have a lot of interest in carrying on, you know, the legacy and, and running the Eaton department stores. Obviously, he still had you know, money coming in and and inheritance, but he was kind of like doing his own thing. He drank a lot, wasn't making the best decisions. And so when they divorced, it didn't really leave a lot for Nancy and Nancy. And she was in and out of court with her ex-husband just trying to get support. And because of that, it definitely put a strain on young Nancy and her father's relationship growing up. One thing she had always though and could count on was her mother. Reading about her mother, I took it as like, you know, just very nurturing, involved. Um, I, I think some people might think of it like as like helicopter parent, even though Nancy was in her young 20s. Her mom would call several times throughout the day and they would check in, but it sounded like Nancy enjoyed it like they were they that was both reciprocated it wasn't like oh my gosh I have to answer to my mom and tell her all this stuff it was just expected that was their routine they were just very very close so on the morning of January 21st 1985 all the residents of Toronto they woke up to this just like cluster f of this huge snowstorm and naturally mom and Nancy called daughter Nancy to see if you know she was okay and if she had planned on going to work today or that day I guess she's calling like do you plan on going to work today like I said this was very routine anyways they always started off their morning with a call so this wasn't out of the blue and it was unusual that Nancy didn't answer when her mother called but if the rare occasion did occur that she didn't answer maybe she was you know, freshening up or whatever, she called quickly after and she didn't get an immediate phone call back from Nancy and thought it was a little bit strange. Strange? Let's finish our sentences. Kind of tried to whatever, bypass it and call her back in a little bit. But before she got a chance to do it, her phone did ring and she's like, oh, okay, well, there, there she is. So she answers expecting to hear her daughter on the other end, but instead she hears a male saying, good morning, it's a beautiful day. I can only imagine how confusing that would be, A, because it is a male that is on the other end and she's expecting her daughter, and B, they are in the middle of a record-breaking snowstorm. I think this snowstorm actually, like, it, it made history. It was, it was, it even affected the United States. So definitely odd, and she just sits there kind of like, seeing if she recognizes the voice and then it repeats again saying it's a beautiful day today and then hung up the phone so nancy calls her daughter back again there is no answer and leaves a message and again just tried to brush it aside and go on with her day by the time afternoon rolled around and she still hadn't heard from nancy she decided to call the real estate office that nancy worked at to see if she had come in and it's then that she realizes that nobody from the office had heard from her all day mrs eaton leaves a couple more messages on nancy's machine pleading with her to just call her back letting her know that she's worried but when she doesn't hear anything by 7 30 p.m she decides to go to Nancy's apartment. Because of how close they are, she has a spare key. So she uses that key to get in and she walks into just this eerie darkness in in Nancy's apartment. She calls out to her and there's no response. 
as she's making her way through, she's hardly being able to see what's in the room and her eyes are kind of adjusting a little bit to how dark it is. And she can kind of see that there's like this darker stain on the carpet and that there's something on Nancy's bed as she's getting closer. Before she can make it out, she trips on something as she's trying to go for the table lamp to get some light on. And she falls on the floor, falls into this dark stain, and realizes that it's wet. Keep in mind, it's still dark. She's struggling to see what's around her. And as she's looking around, she sees that all of Nancy's bedding is on the floor next to the bed where she's fallen. And so she lifts the blankets and there she sees her daughter covered in blood. Nancy was dead and savagely murdered. Immediately when Nancy's mother saw her daughter's body, things are just racing in her mind and she knows, oh my gosh, this is a result of my daughter's heart, my daughter's kindness, my daughter's willingness to bring people into her life, into her home to make sure that they are okay. They took advantage of her and she believed she knew who did it. Now, although at this point in Nancy's life, she wasn't the closest with her father, she still did hold on to some of the family traditions from his side. And one of those was spending time in the summer at the Eaton Summer House in Muskoka. And it's there that she ended up meeting a young man named Andrew LaShawn Hughes. Andrew was the grandson to the neighbors that lived next door. And he was a uh, a member of the very wealthy Osler family. His mother was related to the on the off, on the Osler side, and they have like a a huge huge roster, I guess if you will, a very like influential people, top dog lawyers, bankers, politicians. Just one of their ancestors, his one of his side business ventures was the president of the Dominion Bank, which is now TD Bank, which is a huge bank in Canada. So you can only imagine, I guess, like the, the crowd that is at this M Muskoka lake house life. And Andrew is technically, you know, Nancy's neighbor for the summer, both staying at their family's summer houses. Andrew was several years younger than Nancy. He was born on July 14th, 1967. He was born in Montreal, Quebec, where my, my parents are born. And he was born to parents, Sarah and Ernest. I have not heard the name Ernest in so long and I kind of miss it now just hearing that. Andrew's birth sounds rather traumatic. Um, he was born and his umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck. So it had actually cut off quite a bit of blood flow to his brain. Allegedly, it took him almost five minutes to cry out when he was born. I cannot imagine how terrifying that would have been for his parents. And later in life, the fact that he was deprived of oxygen for that long will come up as, I guess, you know, like the catalyst of issues that will follow him for life. Now, it's not something that's dormant and everybody's like, oh, oh my gosh, where where is this coming from? Starting at a very, very young age, just as a toddler, Andrew would throw tantrums. These aren't just described as going through your terrible twos, though. These these were overboard, very destructive, um, very physical, aggressive. By the time he got into school, he was described as a student that was very bright and eager to learn, but he also acted out and did have difficulty in class. Several of his teachers did believe that he had ADD. Again, I know back in the 80s, 90s, there was just so much misconception then, especially even with the diagnosis. It was kind of just like throwing medication at kids those days and not just looking at the root of what was going on. And nowadays, I, I will say that when it comes to this specifically, there are teacher's aides and we've gone leaps and bounds in terms of allowing kids with um, learning difficulties to still be in the same class as their peers and having somebody come in and focus just a little bit harder with them. But, you know, we're, we're talking about the 80s. So just keep that in mind also as we're, we're talking about the school era. 
I'll get my to my opinion about the other stuff later. Because of the misconception of treatment and, and such for ADD back in the day and just like kind of like throwing medication at kids and I don't want to say writing them off but I just remember being in class with kids who did have ADD and it was like they were always seen as like super problematic the te- you could tell the teachers treated them differently they they sat in different areas and they should have been at the front but now I'm always, like thinking back they were always in the back which is probably the worst spot for them because it was even harder for them to concentrate and learn back there and then became you know more destructive because they're in the back nobody's paying attention to them and so by the time Andrew was 10 he was seeing like psychiatrists and psychologists thinking that there was you know this like monster within him and they're hoping to get answers for this child who is uncontrollable and nobody at this point could pinpoint a specific diagnosis so with all of this going on and uh, people throwing out all of these different assumptions and the solution just not getting rectified he's just kind of being put into one doctor after another without answers by the time he was a teenager his behavior was you know off the charts troubling. At this point, he's 13 years old. He's stealing his parents' vehicle. He was had broken into his grandparents' house. His violence was becoming very alarming. At one time, he chased his mother around the house with a knife. He had become such a threat for other people's safety that in school, people worried about their their children that there were there teachers worried about the other students he was eventually kicked out of school so he just continued going through more psychiatric evaluations one of the main I guess diagnosis says that diagnoses that was coming up was that they were explaining his behavior as like intense teenage angst so there's like teenage angst and then whatever he was going through was that but just on like a more intense scale and as Andrew and his parents are you know getting this feedback they're they're not knowing what what it is these are the professionals but they're also questioning it saying like this is is so much more than that and just one after another they're kind of I I guess kind of getting pushed away which kind of is it's not kind of it is quite concerning that a family this prominent back then um it really gives perspective as to I mean even the the kids that were in my class in the 90s that I remember and stories about my husband that he went through he definitely had you know severe ADD it sounds like and had to go through I mean I'll, I, I don't want to like put him on blast or anything like that it can be a story he can share but quite traumatizing um, things it's just there's no way to put it there was not a lot known of how to just effectively help and treat these kids at that time so by 15 years old Andrew had I don't know maybe had enough of hearing that there wasn't more of an explanation and I guess cure or light at the end of the tunnel and help that he could get and he ended up attempting to kill himself by swallowing a bunch of pain medication just as the doctors were unequipped and uncertain as to what to do with Andrew it sounds like so were his parents they had never experienced anything like this before and the fact that they are going for you know answers for answers from the doctors and not getting them they had nowhere to go and as Andrew would explain it he felt unsupported by his parents and that this was like a call for help that went unrecognized it was just like okay let's just treat him put him in the hospital keep him alive um glad you survived and then we're just going to you know forget about this and move past this like you're okay now so really he it was just like a ping pong effect he would try to get better not get better go even further down the hole he just rebelled so much continued stealing breaking into I don't know why his grandparents were always the subject but broke 
into his grandparents' house several times and not just broke into it, but like would break the windows, smash the place. He also robbed a convenience store and and stole cigarettes. At one point, he eventually was arrested and he spent a couple nights in a youth detention center and was given a year probation. So again, he just, he went back home. Things were a little, you know, a little bit better for a period of time and then shit just hit the fan. There was another physical altercation. Andrew lunged and threw a screwdriver at his father and at this point his parents had decided you know maybe it's us like we're clearly our environment something is not going well here and they thought to reach out to his mother Sarah's sister to see if she could try to take Andrew and see if he would do any better in in her home. They thought this was a good idea because Andrew had always gotten along quite well with his mother sister who is his aunt Amy and her husband his uncle Bill and so they agreed to take him in unfortunately though just the fact that they had always gotten along and that he had respected them within family visiting settings it was not the same when it was like a live-in experience and his aunt and uncle soon saw these violent outbursts his aunt amy said uh, everything came to a head in december 1982 when her nephew andrew pointed a loaded gun at her and threatened to shoot her and it wasn't until she just calm tried to calm him down and coax him into giving him the gun that he kind of like snapped out of it, put it down, begged for forgiveness, cried. And all of this was because he was trying to steal his uncle's motorcycle. Now, thank God he never pulled the trigger, but this was a very alarming sign that things were escalating. This wasn't just going from him breaking into family members' houses when they were not there and and stealing vehicles. Now this was threats of murder. And his aunt even explained that she saw like this obvious significant change in him when he was pointing that gun at her. So after this incident at his aunt and uncle's he was sent to a um, very expensive institute in Connecticut where he had uh, his brain scanned and the doctor believed that he had undiagnosed epilepsy he at this point was prescribed um anti-convulsive drugs to try and combat um I think it's dis discontrol syndrome or intermittent explosive disorder. I believe it was Catherine Fogarty who explained it on her podcast of her episode on this case where it basically is like a pattern of frequent violent outbursts without being provoked. So it would, you know, you're just in like a, a social setting and then there there's not really anything that provoke something of that magnitude and you just like this the person kind of goes off the handle on top of trying this route uh his doctors also suggested that andrew not be with his parents and maybe stay at a treatment center part of that was to try and narrow down specifically what andrew needed and what his diagnosis was and see if this was going to work and then another part of it was that his doctors did believe that at this point things are escalating and that it could get to the point where there was going to be serious harm done to either himself or somebody else when andrew's parents heard about this diagnosis, the drugs that they wanted to try Andrew on, they were not, they were not down with it. They absolutely disagreed. And when he was released from the Connecticut institution, his parents decided to just have him take more tests and see more doctors for other opinions. This just kind of repeated all of what Andrew had already gone through up until this point in life, he saw several different doctors. Nobody could say specifically what it was. Their feedback was that he was respectful when they were seeing him. He looked healthy and that he was just 
kind of going through things in life. Andrew was also sent to a treatment center in Toronto and the doctors there, they disagreed with what the Connecticut doctor said. They believed that there were no brain abnormalities and their opinion was that either he had attention deficit disorder or a conduct disorder. The only thing that these doctors had in common and agreed on was that they did believe that Andrew should not be treated and living with his parents at the the same time. They believed that there is a po- there was a possibility that all of his issues were stemming from his relationship with his family. So the treatment center in Toronto, the Hinks Treatment Center, had recommended that he do a uh, an, a residential treatment program and that he also do family therapy within his family to repair whatever might be going on there. Andrew agreed to it. Unfortunately, his parents did not. It kind of sounded like they were just after answers as to like what what specifically was going on with Andrew. Like don't even look over here. This is not the issue. We we just need answers over here. And while that may, you know, while that may be, maybe they were doing the best they can. And I do realize again, we we were in the eighties here, different stigmas and stuff. I hope that we can learn from this and be like, even if you as a parent don't think that there's anything that you need to work on or, you know, therapy that you need to do as a family unit collectively, you know, just just do it. It 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 just try it out and and then you could see and it's just that support, you know, that there's that you're also in it and that there's not something like wrong here that you're just trying to and not not fix yourself or be supportive and learn the tools as to like what you can do you know, to just be um, all on the same page. So once again, we really were at a point where there are still no answers as to what is going on with Andrew. And now him and Nancy are both at their grandparents' summer houses and they had known each other since they were younger, but it wasn't until the summer of 1983 that they had became quite close friends. Nancy at this time is 22 and Andrew is 16. And even though there is, you know, a significant age gap, they definitely found relatability from the worlds that they came from, their family lives and this just degree of wealth and being born into this lifestyle. And Nancy being somebody who found joy and happiness, just being that friend that was there for everybody and, you know, wanted wanted to lift people up, she really took on this role of being a big sister to Andrew. She even called him her her little bro that she had to to look out for. And it was obvious that Andrew had a lot of respect for Nancy. He was able to open up to her and share a lot of what was going on with him, with his struggles, the fact that he was constantly going to all of these treatment centers and seeing all of these doctors and not getting answers and thinking, you know, something was wrong with him. Nancy was really a good outlet for him to talk and her to just listen. And he never felt judged by her. Now, sadly, what can happen in this situation is it becomes a dependence. And that's definitely what happened with Andrew talking to Nancy and being around her became much more of a dependence that he could just kind of like unload everything on as opposed to a friendship where you could just kind of be like hey I need to I need to get out of the house do you want to go go somewhere and talk she was kind of turning into I guess like the therapist so when the summer ended and she wasn't as you know as close as like next door Andrew would just show up unannounced at Nancy's home but she would always welcome him in she always listened to what he had to say she'd talk him through everything they would hang out watch tv and oftentimes she would set up a little bed for him on her couch and he would sleep over what he ended up realizing pretty quickly after the summer and when you know Nancy had to go back to her real life was that it was really busy for her. She worked in a real estate office. She also had a very hectic social life so she wasn't always at um, his disposal. And this was something he 
did not like if she was unavailable he was very I guess brazen about it he would show up at her apartment and if she wasn't there Nancy's neighbors said that he would just start like kicking screaming and punching the door and they tell Nancy and she just kind of brushed it off saying yeah he doesn't really deal with stress in the best ways he I guess expresses it quite violent at times but that's just how he deals with it and gets it out like he would never actually harm me. Unfortunately just the reality of the situation was that is not the case like he was becoming much more aggressive much more violent and dangerous. He had gone back to behaviors like stealing his parents vehicle. He had even stolen Nancy's vehicle. He broke into the family cottage and shot up the neighbor's cottage next door and then just to top it off um also stole a a few motor boats while he was at it there was a psychiatric report around this time that stated that they believed andrew was acting like this and it was all stemming from his parents and that he was just wanting their attention Um, He was wanting their acceptance and that this was just basically a very over-the-top cry for help. So one month before he turned 17, Andrew was remanded to the Ontario Mental Health Center. And out of kind of all of the roots and ventures he had taken, this initially did seem to be working the best. He was able to work through controlling those violent outbursts that he was experiencing. He was also making friends with people that he could relate to, which I'm assuming would probably feel, you know, more comforting to feel like you're not alone. And whenever his parents came to visit, it was very positive interactions. They Everybody was getting along. So he stayed there for about three months. And then in September 1984, he was discharged. And when he was discharged, his doctor's again thought that it was going to be best for him to kind of maintain the work that they had done and for him to live independently and away from his parents. Based on things going well at this time and their relationship, everybody could agree, had improved, they decided to listen and not want to, you know, rock the boat or anything. So Andrew ended up moving into a rooming house. It was quite close to his parents. And then he also got a a part-time job. So he's living a lot more independently. He ended up spending Christmas and New Year's with his parents. Everything seemed to be going fine. But shortly after New Year's, his parents tell him that they are going to be going to Mexico for a couple weeks to go and visit his grandparents who had moved out there. And this seems to be a trigger for Andrew. He did talk to a friend about it saying that his parents were going on this trip and he expressed that he missed his grandparents, that he wanted to go and see them as well and that he was hurt that he wasn't invited. So at this point he's able to recognize what the trigger is, express it and know that okay like I'm feeling like this because I I'm hurt because I wasn't invited. And he felt himself losing control. So he he called his uncle. He told his uncle, I'm going through this. I'm not feeling very in a very good space right now. And he was it was teetering on the side of him being suicidal again. So his uncle immediately takes him to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist talks to Andrew briefly and diagnoses him with having normal teenage hormone changes and when they leave Andrew says it is definitely deeper than this I know that I need help so his uncle brought him back to the Ontario Mental Health Center he sees the therapist that he had been working with prior and he lets them know I think I'm gonna explode and so they take him in to do some group like group therapy classes which helps Andrew feel like okay I have a grasp on things, I kind of lost control there, and now I recognize what I need to do in the next instance that there's a trigger, and I think that I'm equipped to not get to like that outburst point. So he left the mental health center, and then 
three days later, he showed up at Nancy's apartment. It was Sunday, January 20th, 1985, and he knocked on Nancy's door at around 9 p.m. And remember, this is just like a, a build up to a very, very miserable night and next day in the city. It is cold. It is blistering outside. And when he arrived, Nancy was already tucked in in bed. She had a migraine. But when she answered the door, she could tell that Andrew was upset. So she got him, you know, set up with his little bed on the couch and decided to stay up for a little bit and keep him company. Andrew said they watched the end of the Super Bowl game and then the two of them just talked for several hours and he shared with her that he was feeling, you know, really low in life, kind of like he was just stumbling through and just coasting through life. He didn't really have a career path. There wasn't many people in his life that he could confide in and talk to. And he had felt that he was making progress with his parents when he was at the health facility. And now, you know, into the new year, everything seemed to be back. They've abandoned him and gone to Mexico without him. While Nancy and Andrew are talking for several hours, there are two phone calls that come through that are Nancy's mom just calling and checking in like they do. And Nancy tells her mom that Andrew's there, that he had left the mental health center, and that he was just needing a friend. And Nancy's mom, Mama Nancy, even spoke to Andrew and she said, you know, congratulations for doing what you needed to do, staying there for three months and kind of being able to recognize what needs to be done to prevent you from kind of going down that path again and just reassured him that everything was going to be okay, that struggles were temporary. He was on the right path, recognizing that that there needed to be a change and that eventually everything was going to be all right. Andrew got off the phone with um, Nancy's mom just kind of thanking her for her kind words but deep down he he was very jealous of Nancy and her mom's relationship. This is a relationship that he yearned for. He wanted to have the parents that were calling him multiple times a day to check in and just chat and be friends and see how you know how their day was going. It was around 1 a.m. that Nancy went to go to bed in her room while Andrew got himself all tucked in on the couch. And like I said at the beginning, the next morning, Monday, January 21st, people woke up to just a cluster F outside. The blizzard had literally like Elsa from Frozen just froze the city. People were stranded. Schools were closed. Uh, everybody was basically advised you know just stay home for the day unless it is an emergency to leave and so Nancy's mom started off her day with calling her daughter to check in make sure she had heard the news if she hadn't looked outside already and seen everything and wanted to know if she if she planned on going into work but there was no answer and that's when we know her her phone rang again and she heard somebody on the other line saying good morning to her and that it was a beautiful day. I think one thing I also want to bring up is keep in mind this is also a point where there's no star 67 or like call display. I was thinking about that. I was like well who was it? Didn't you star 67 the call or or see who it was? And so it would probably would have been even you know, more understandable and easier to understand why Mrs. Eaton would have tried to talk her herself out of it and just go go on with her day and not try to hover or intrude or let her think the worst. And in these situations I hate that so much because it's like there are there are so many times in life where you're just like, okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna think the worst that person didn't answer. Oh, I watch too much, you know, dateline and I always go to the worst. And then you're just like gutted because it's like in this situation we know that it literally was the worst case scenario for Mrs. Eaton. We know she went to Nancy's apartment, tripped on Nancy's leg that was buried under her bedding on the floor, landed, you know, in her own daughter's blood on the carpet, and ultimately moves these blankets and discovers her daughter dead. When Mrs. Eaton found Nancy, naturally, she was in absolute hysterics. She calls 911. 
tells them where the apartment is and then ran outside barefoot in this snowstorm in absolute hysterics waiting for the police to arrive. As soon as they arrive, Nancy just keeps repeating, she's dead, she's dead, I know who did it, it was Andrew. So the responding officers, they make their way up to Nancy's fourth floor apartment and when they turn the lights on, they can see just absolute horror. Almost every surface in Nancy's bedroom was splattered with blood. And when they look under the bed, they find what they believe is the murder weapon. They find this bloodied knife with this long blade and the the blade is actually bent out of shape from just hitting I mean there's no way to like sugar-coated way to say it like hitting the body like so aggressively that it it had bent and on top of her bed was a like a potted plant so that would have been what Mrs. Eaton had seen when she was trying to look through the dark and was like seeing this dark shadow on the bed it was just like plant on the bed and also in this around the scene was like two raw eggs that were broken on the floor one of them was in Nancy's bedroom and then one of them was in the bathroom so very alarming scene I can imagine quite confusing as well with those items you know just randomly throughout the apartment and even though Nancy's mom was inconsolable she was just very insistent that she knew who the killer was And she just kept saying it was Andrew LaShawn Hughes. She knew he was at her daughter's apartment the night before, had spent the night. And she knew this for a fact because she had even spoken to him. It's at this point she also realizes like, oh my gosh, he is probably the one who called me and I spoke to this morning. Quickly, the police discover that Nancy's 1979 Buick Skylark was missing. So they sent out like a a bolo, be on the lookout for her car. And they were lucky because they also had personalized plates that were easy to remember. The plate was Tiger, which was her her nickname that her family had given her. Thankfully, the search for Nancy's vehicle and potential suspect into her murder it was not very long. Just before midnight, Toronto police had received a phone call from Bradford police to say that Nancy's car had been spotted at the entrance of a gas station. I guess her car had stalled and was stuck and so Andrew was trying to get this car unstuck and there just happened to be a responding officer and noticed the the plates on the car and realized that this was associated with a murder and Andrew was quickly taken into custody. Once he was apprehended, Andrew, he never denied killing Aunt Nancy. He admitted that he was responsible for her death and he even walked police officers through what had happened. And he said that it was actually that morning, the morning of January 21st, he woke up to Nancy's TV that had been programmed to automatically turn on at 8 10 a.m and it woke him up he walked into nancy's room he said she was still sleeping and he just nonchalantly walked to the kitchen picked up a butcher knife went back to nancy's bedroom and he said that he just stood over her for several minutes just watching her sleep and then out of nowhere just started stabbing her repeatedly he said that she she woke up she screamed she tried to fight back and Andrew just kept stabbing until eventually Nancy couldn't fight anymore and just stopped moving this is even more disturbing I I mean the whole thing is just everything we talk about is so disturbing but you know just trigger warning he even admitted to police that after he realized that Nancy was dead he you know observed her looked at the work that he had done and you know was very excited and proud at what he had just done to her and even proceeded to have you know relations with her dead body police even asked him about um some of the odd things around the apartment like the eggs and andrew he just kind of brushed that off he said oh he was just juggling some eggs that he'd gotten from the fridge and then one of them dropped in the bathroom so he just like 
had tossed the other. It wasn't meant to send a message or was nothing cryptic or anything like that. He said he, just like very matter of factly, like oh, I was just juggling. He remembered the egg part, but he didn't have any memory, he said, of why there was a plant on the bed or calling Nancy's mom that morning. So he never admitted to being the one that actually placed that call. After killing Nancy, he made himself um, some coffee. He had a shower and he put on a track suit that belonged to Nancy to go go out and venture in this blizzard. What is ironic is he he had taken Nancy's car. He had taken $45 and he actually drove to the nearby Eaton department store or Eaton Center, I guess it is what they're known as. It's just a department store, but like they're Eaton Center. I don't know. That's just like so cryptic. It's like, yes, of course, it's the, you know, the Eaton's, Eaton's are iconic, but it's like the, the store that is named after Nancy's great, great grandfather. So at the mall, Andrew said he met up with a friend that he owed $40 to, so he paid him back. And then he said he had forged a check that he had taken from Nancy's house for $150, and he spent that on some beer at a restaurant that was in the mall and bought some clothes since he was wearing Nancy's tracksuit. And he told police that he had the intention of driving to Collingwood, which is a ski resort that he often went to as a kid and he said that he planned to drive out there and drive off a cliff in Nancy's vehicle because he was reflecting and feeling bad about what he had done and wanted to die. So with his confession, Andrew was charged with first degree murder of his friend Nancy Eaton. And I'm sure you can just imagine like what the headlines would have been at that time. Like it, it, this was a story that completely shook Toronto, not only because she's like the heiress to this huge family dynasty, but also learning that it was her friend who's this 17-year-old boy who looks just, you know, like he looks young. He's from this prominent family and was somebody that she was, you know, trying to just take under her wing and help. So the hope and assumption was obviously that he would get life in prison. Prison? Prison? Sounds like Mo Moira. I mean, not just due to the heinousness of the crime, but also because of his confession. But Andrew's parents had poured every resource possible that they could and hired one of Canada's top defense lawyers, a man named Clayton Ruby. And he argued that, yes, this crime was gruesome. There was a lot of evidence. But Andrew, he stated, was not guilty for killing Nancy due to his mental space at the time and that he was not aware of his actions while he was carrying them out. So Andrew pleaded not guilty by reasons of insanity. Trial began on September 15th, 1986. And I think one of the things that broke my heart so much learning about this was what Nancy's mom had gone through since her death and after. And obviously after her daughter died, she just had lost the will to live. And not only had she lost Nancy, but Nancy's father had died before trial could start. And even though Nancy and her husband, Edward, weren't married anymore, they had really come a long way and were making efforts to just have a healthy relationship. They had all just spent Christmas together three weeks before Nancy's murder, which I thought was really beautiful because, you know, even though Nancy was in her 20s, it wasn't like, oh, you know, like she's grown. We don't have to work on this anymore and just still be a family. Like it's, I think people forget how important family dynamic is even after your kids are grown. It, it How nice is that to have you know parents who are divorced and you're an adult but can still celebrate all together and and you know be a family unit for that day I talked about this on TikTok I'm, I'm very much a believer of the blended family when you can when it you can and it's safe and works for you and now by the time trial came Edward Eaton had also died he died of a stroke only six months after Nancy was killed which left Mama Nancy by herself. I guess her only solace in life turned to Nancy's little cat 
who was named Tinkerbell, who was in her apartment and police had found hiding, scared under the bed when when they found Nancy murdered. For the prosecution side to try and dispel any credibility to an insanity plea, they argued that there were actions that Andrew carried out that showed that he was aware what he did after the murder, that he, you know, that he knew that she was murdered and that it was wrong and that there was, you know, some efforts of trying to like get away or distance himself rather. I think that's a better word. One of them being that he had thrown all of her bedding on her so that he didn't have to look at what he had done. That is usually a a, a big indicator of somebody being very close to a victim of a crime if there's like something over their face after the fact because they don't want to acknowledge and, and look at, at what they've actually just done. He also made the efforts to stay around the apartment. He made a cup of coffee. He took a shower to wash off all of the blood on his body, changed into fresh clothes. When he looked around the apartment and realized that there was only about $40 in cash, he decided to forge a check, you know, put Nancy's signature on it. You know, he's doing actions that he's very aware of. It's not like he just wandered off covered in blood signed his own name or whatever. Like these are very deliberate, methodical, thought out actions. For the defense, they focused more on not that he wasn't aware of what was right and wrong, but that he had just kind of gotten to this place and it was like a long time coming and that the Ontario health system had failed Andrew and basically said that they were the reason that Nancy was dead. They argued that he, Andrew had taken all of the steps that he would have needed to to keep himself safe, keep others safe by going to the mental health center. That second time when he went, it was basically just kind of like gave him a pat out the door like, yeah, you're doing okay. You know what you need to do to get yourself out of this space do some group therapy class, and go play some hockey. Now, the Crown had not called any psychiatric experts. They felt like just due to the nature of the crime, the fact that that Nancy was sexually assaulted after that Andrew had confessed and seemed to be very aware based on his actions after the fact that that was enough and I yeah that that's a little troubling because in a a case where you're the defense is not guilty by reasons of insanity and this is all based around mental health in, in my opinion it probably would have been a very good idea to have several experts the prosecution side to also weigh in because the defense had a lot they they had passed doctors that had worked with Andrew. They also had expert witnesses that came and basically just explained that, yeah, there is an element of him knowing that it was, you know, no aware of what he was doing, but that in his mind, he was able to just kind of like shut, shut it off. When the actual act was going on and he was stabbing Nancy, there was just like this complete disconnect. And then and then there, you know, there's no way of, of them assuming what had happened after the fact. But when that act was carried out specifically, he was not in his right mind. Another thing that was hard to, you know, dispute for the prosecution was that there was a lot of arguments stemming around Andrew's brain injury that he had from birth when he, you know, was deprived of oxygen for almost five minutes. He had grown up with all of these issues and they were constantly trying to figure out what was going on but it always seemed to be coming back to this first experience with life and he's he had brain damage at the end of the day the main argument was that Andrew had killed Nancy this friend like who he felt like was his only friend in the world really that loved him and understood him he kills her because the health system had failed him So on the ninth day of trial, it comes to just a screaming halt. And the Crown conceded that that there was an overwhelming amount of evidence that Andrew was legally insane. 
So what this did was basically made it for the jury to not have to um, have a verdict when it came to his intent and timing related to the killing and also the assault. So the judge basically told the jury that with an insanity verdict, this would make sure that Andrew would most likely never go free unless his illness was cured or controlled to the point where he was no longer a threat to society. So the jury took that, they took 17 minutes and they found Andrew Hughes not guilty by reasons of insanity. He was sent to Oak Ridge, which was a high security unit at the Ontario Mental Health Center. And 14 years after he had been committed to that facility, he had requested a transfer to Royal Ottawa Hospital forensic ward. And this would give him more freedom. He would be able to leave the hospital grounds unattended. He still would have had, you know, would have to inform the staff and and his doctors where he was going, but he didn't need supervision. And what's concerning is that despite several of the doctors feeling that he was too dangerous for those privileges and that he had not done well on testing of whether he was going to be a danger to society or not and that he was believed to be like a very clever psychopath, he was granted the transfer to that minimum security. And later that year, he was caught having an an inappropriate appropriate relationship with one of the psychiatric nurses and with a fellow patient both of which you know you're not allowed to do and the nurse was fired so he had still he had still stayed and then in 2006 21 years after Nancy's murder Andrew had requested to be fully discharged and at this point it was now supported by the doctors that he was working with and this was basically based on the fact that he had sh- he was showing that he was making uh, strides in life to do better he had enrolled in college to take business and he was getting good grades and working part time so he was released and allegedly relocated to BC British Columbia right next door to me sadly Nancy's mother Mrs. Eaton passed away in 2017. She was 82 years old. And allegedly she just, she was never able to recover from her daughter's death, understandably. And she was laid to rest beside Nancy, which as a mother just like completely ugh, broke my heart, breaks my heart. You know, I can just, ugh, makes me want to cry. But in the same sense, it's like, I, it was comforting to learn as a mom to just be like, okay, you're you're with your baby again. And like I said at the beginning of this, I, I'm so interested to know your guys' thoughts going through this based on what I had, you know, said to think about throughout because I, I just like wish we could finish this by saying like we have come so far since then, you know, at least the Nancy didn't die in vain and this was what was learned from this case. And yeah, when it when it comes to I guess mental health specifically and like resources, I feel like we're not even close. I, I I can acknowledge the fact that I do love that there are more conversations. People are opening up much more about their struggles. I think that in itself can help tremendously when you feel like you're not alone and you can relate to somebody and it's almost kind of easier for you to pinpoint, okay, like this, yeah, that that's kind of what I'm feeling and that's what it sounds like and then you kind of have a starting point. So in that I I can I can acknowledge that we have made big changes but when it comes to mental health it's like just you know look at into any facility like the wait lists to speak to somebody are astronomical there are not enough professionals out there to help and going based off my personal experiences with what I'm seeing my family go through right now. I have two sisters who are studying psychology right now and it almost makes it impossible for people to become, you know, highly qualified and skilled and get, you know, like their top like doctorate. It is the the, the costs are, are just alarming. And I don't know, that just it it it's sad because I have one sister who's like I, it's not feasible. Like I, there is no way that I can continue down this 
path at this point in my life. And that really sucks because I think she would just be amazing. And you're taking a lot of really great people off of the table that could help. So anyways, I was really frustrated. I wish I had just a more positive way. I try to, you know, we talk about such heavy things. It's nice to try to see some positivity and some change to learn from these experiences. And I really felt at the end of this that I was just like, oh, okay. (laughs) We are literally still in the 80s when it comes to making care accessible and not kind of just like rushing people through like, oh, it's probably just this. Oh, it's probably, it's really, it's just really upsetting and frustrating because it's like, what, what do we do? I could literally go on for hours about this. I'm not going to. There may or may not be a new outlet being in the works for these types of conversations that are not on this channel but stay tuned because that that in itself we don't know what we what 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 I can provide all right I'm gonna go I'm gonna go cry and scream in the corner I'm kidding oh my gosh okay yeah I would I'm just I'm I, I it's so sad I wish I could I wish that I could be like oh my gosh we've we've done so well anyways I'm gonna go because I'm just gonna ramble and I could talk about this for hours Nancy deserves so much better her her memory and legacy deserves so much better and I definitely want to make it a priority just like on my for myself to continue having the the conversation and normalizing having help or navigating every day with mental struggles because um yeah, we 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 need that because this should yeah this just should have never happened. Nancy should be here, and I will leave you with that. That is it for me today. If you have not already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. It helps me so much. I love and I appreciate you. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.